Prolific writer, journalist, and historian Jeff Pierce has been visiting Ethiopia for some time now. And we're going to spend some time with him talking about his visits and also current issues happening in Ethiopia in this edition of Addis Dialogue. With it, I'm Shifar Alako to stay with us. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, thank you for having me. First of all, uh, now that you are here in Ethiopia, I can't afford to miss uh, your comments about Ethiopia. Uh, what does Ethiopia mean to you? For me, Ethiopia is this endless supply of amazing stories. The history is so rich and exciting um, that I could, uh, if I don't watch, if I don't watch out, I could end up spending my entire life studying it. Uh, and unfortunately, there's enough that I could spend my life studying it. In terms of the world, um, to me. The thing is, uh, I've recently been working on a book which is called The Gifts of Africa, which will be out next uh, spring, around that time. And in it, there is a lot of Ethiopia in it, and how Ethiopia was a guiding star for the rest of Africa to an extent, and for black people, especially um, in North America, in terms of the United States and so forth. They looked to Ethiopian uh, uh, culture, they looked to Ethiopianism as this kind of inspirational model for them. So there's that. Um, and plus we have to remember you had um, what most Westerners don't even know is that you were sending diplomats to Europe in the 14th century. You were an international minded country. You had philosophers and I'll I'm, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name, Zara Jacob, um, who you know came up with ideas which were similar to Descartes. Western people don't know this, so the entire book is actually about it's about the rest of Africa as well. But the thing is, uh, most Westerners they think in terms of Renaissance thinkers, they think in terms of Greek thinkers, they never think in terms of African thinkers. And chief among those African thinkers are Ethiopians. Chief among those influencing those uh, cultures that had the most influence uh, in terms of shaping thought is Ethiopian culture. So there's a lot to cover there. Let's also talk about uh, your visit uh, to the different parts of the country. Um, what are some of the uh, observations that you witnessed uh, while visiting Ethiopia? Seven years ago, when I first visited this country, I came here partly for research and partly as, well, let's face it, a kind of a vacation for myself, but it was also for work on my book, Prevail. Um, now, I did the normal historical tour because that's what you do as a tourist, especially from the West. But it just so happened that it worked perfectly in terms of my research for the book. So I went to Axum, I went to Lalibela, I went to Gondor, I went to Harar, because it was all fitting into the book. But this time around, I'm here to work. Two diaspora organizations sent me here. They funded my trip. They said, go and find out what's happening. And of course, I'm going to places which are troubled spots where people are uh, hurt, where they're traumatized, um, where there has been war. And so I went to, uh, we had to go to Hamara because I was on the way of my cadre. I went back to Gondor, one of my favorite places in the world, um, because we needed to speak to university professors there. We went to Desi, uh, where we interviewed IDPs, internally displaced persons. We went to an army base, um, which I, of course, will not tell the location for the sake of security. Um, so you get to see another side of Ethiopia that tourists and Westerners don't normally see. This is a country I could be wrong, but my impression is when people think and want to visit Ethiopia, they come to the historical spots, but what they don't realize is this is a country still of villages. Overwhelmingly, the great population that lives in this country lives out in the country. Um, they do not have access to probably running water. You will see people, you know, carrying big, like, plastic sort of jugs of water. You'll see women hauling firewood. There are ways of life in this country that probably haven't changed in two centuries, even affected by war, by all the wars that have been happening. They, that life goes on. 
Um, and I think we have to remember that because the standard thinking in terms of diplomacy, in terms of statecraft, in terms of this crisis itself, we think, okay, uh, what are they thinking in Addis? So you see these diplomats from the United States, they come to Addis. And I recall, and I hope I have my facts right, but I recall the government of Ethiopia very boldly and courageously saying, well, come out and we'll show you what we're dealing with. We'll take you to these places. And some of these diplomats said, no, nope, not interested. They didn't even bother to make the trip. How can you make a decision about a country when you're not gonna bother to go see it? Um, so it was hard work, but at the same time, I have the privilege of having to, well, maybe privilege is uh, a dubious word, but yes, I was privileged to see these situations. Um, and I've seen some terrible things and some horrific things, but things that need to be seen and need to be shared. We went to my cadre. We saw, and it's important here that I acknowledge the brilliant reporting of a gentleman called Jamel Countess, who is a brilliant photojournalist. He did the groundbreaking work on talking to my cadre of victims and taking their photos. Um, whatever I did, I followed in his footsteps. We got the chance to interview those victims. And in a video which I have uploaded to my channel, you can see a parade, a pan, of these victims, some pointing to scars where sharp weapons or like axes and, and blades have struck their heads. Um, talking to women who, you know, they've, there's a poignant, horrible story of a woman who talks about how a husband is on a roof and because they think the TPLF are going for the kid, the guy jumps down, he dies. She's lost her husband. Um, the only reason why they didn't kill the kid was, according to the woman, if I remember the version properly, she said, oh, we're going to come back tomorrow. We'll take care of the kids tomorrow. We visited by a house where a man was burned alive. The wreckage is still there. Uh, the, the shambles, the burned out sort of charred remains of it. We visited a graveyard where they used a bulldozer to move about 300 bodies or 50 to 60 bodies in one spot alone sometimes. The bulldozer is still there. Um, they used mattresses to carry the corpses. Mattresses are all lined up against sort of a perimeter wall, I guess as some kind of silent tribute to those victims. These things need to be seen. They need to be spoken of. They need to be discussed and they sure as hell need to get communicated to the Western media and diplomatic community. Where the hell are they, pardon my language? Why aren't they pay paying attention to my cadre? So these are the horrific things I've seen. What should Ethiopia do to, to properly convey these horrific um, issues to the whole world? And w what are you going to do in this regard? As I've gone on record before, I believe that I've had um, incidents where I've come back very excited about discovering what, that I've learned something only to find out that there are excellent Ethiopian reporters who have already covered this in your own country and reported it to your own people. And so I say, by God, something this and this happened. And they go, yeah, we heard about that. That was on ETV. <laughs> that was on, you know, another channel. And I'm going, well, why is this not getting out to the Western world? Um, so I think part of the problem is, is that um, the local reporters need to be empowered. They need to have access to these areas. They need to report. And then somebody has to take the next step of saying, look at all the great reportage that's coming out here. This should be going to the world. One of the things which I'm bashing on about and for which I'm probably hated <laughs> in some quarters is the fact that I don't see the need for why the hell a white man comes over here to interpret Africa for the Guardian or interpret Africa for the Economist. There's a guy, there's people here who can do that. Hire them. There are African Ethiopian journalists who could write just as compellingly and properly for a Western audience uh, as they can. Why, why is it that the New York Times sends two white guys to cover what's over here? the photographer and the other guy. Now, I note the irony 
of the fact that I'm saying this. But the fact of the matter is, is two diaspora groups came to me and recruited me and said, please go and find out what's going on. And I said to them, you need one of your own. You need a diaspora person to represent you. And they said, they won't listen to us. The world, the outside world will not listen to us. You've got to go. Now, in answer to your second half of your question, what am I going to do? The TPLF made this personal. Um, I knew nothing about what was going on. If I don't know something, I don't know it. And I'll be quite upfront about my ignorance. There's tons of things, tons of subject matter and stories that I don't know enough about. And I will say, I don't know. That's how we learn. Uh, they came after me and said, why aren't you, why aren't you saying anything about Tigray genocide? Why aren't you saying about anything about Tigray genocide? And I went, because I don't know. Then I researched it. Then I saw the video in which a TPLF spokesman openly confessed to the attack on November 4th. And when I started, when I took a stand, they came after me. Um, there have been attempts to smear me, my personal reputation, my integrity. And they've gone out of their way to smear some very uh, astute, qualified academics and experts, diplomats, who believe in this country, believe in the potential of this country, and they go after them. They're a terrorist organization. They made it personal. I can't fight them conventionally the way you're fighting them on the ground here. But in my own arena of communications and media, okay, because there's a parallel track of this propaganda war going on. And okay, you want to come after me. <laughs> so I will probably be spending more time going after them because I really have come to hate what they do. I hate their message. I hate their ideology, which is divisive um, and is based on getting people to act on their worst impulses. This has to be fought. So unfortunately, uh, they radicalized me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm going to take a little break after this trip, but I'm in it for the long haul because, yeah, I want to see this country succeed. I want to be a friend and good ally to Ethiopian help. So I'm not going away anytime soon. <laughs> so there's that. Western media outlets uh, have jumped, uh, if you will, at the opportunity to report on developments in Tigray following the United Nations Security Council meeting on Ethiopia. At the same time, they have lent or turned a deaf ear to the uh, atrocities uh, being committed by the TPLF in Amhara and Afar uh, states. What have you made out of this? My conclusions are the same as I've always drawn from the beginning. You and I spoke ages ago. You interviewed me while I was right literally in my office area. And... Um, Things have not changed. Uh, if anything, they have not. I think some light is starting, a crack is starting to appear, so some light is getting in, but we're still waiting to see which way it goes. What happened was you have people who come over to a country and they don't make themselves familiar with the history or they read the wrong history. I'll give you a perfect example from Britain. He came over to this country. He wrote, he spent three weeks here. He clearly allowed himself to be led around by the nose by TPLF fixers. We know that the operatives were in Tigray. Uh, they preyed on Western journalists' ignorance. We know this because I interviewed Jamal Countess. He confirmed it in terms of occasions when he saw it in action. He saw it happen to a writer's crew. He saw them try to uh, co-opt him and lead him down the garden path of a story. And he realized, okay, this guy's a, clearly an agent, an operative for them. Um, so he spends three weeks in the country. And then when he goes back, he advertises on Twitter how he's got to learn some of the back history of the country to fill out his article. You've been, I ask you, you've been doing journalism for how long? What journalist goes to a country... <laughs> 
doesn't bother to research it first, then does his homework after he flies home back to London, to Heathrow. It's ridiculous. Um, you have other people who, and he makes stupid mistakes. He makes stupid mistakes in terms of the history of Haile Selassie. He makes stupid mistakes in terms of the history of the country. And we see this again and again. They don't even familiarize themselves with the basic history of Ethiopia. There's plentiful books you can read in the West <laughs> where you can get them. Some are better than others, but you can go and still get Richard Pankhurst, the Ethiopians. You can still get uh, Harold Marcus. <laughs> you can learn, uh, but they don't know. So uh, to bring it up to the more recent developments, what's happened is the thing that I think was a major turning point was the New York Times piece uh, by Declan Walsh and uh, what's his face, O'Reilly. Sorry, I forget his name of the photojournalist. And of course, these people celebrate each other. They all know each other. So they say, great job, fantastic, brilliant reporting, blah, blah. And then it doesn't sink in that they have taken photos of child soldiers. Moreover, they're so oblivious that Walsh writes, highly motivated young recruits, are words to that effect. My God, they're children. And the photos show their children. Now, the beauty of this is, is that nobody can say the photos are doctored. Nobody can say, well, it's directly from the TPLF. The media implicated itself. And so this was a, I think this was a major turning point where people realized, uh-oh, this is, uh-oh. And of course, those of us who were advocates and partisans for Ethiopia jumped on this, of course, because we said, what the hell are you doing? Now, what's interesting is you're seeing people try to rationalize their conscience. And so you have the most distasteful, revolting justifications for this practice to the effect that I've seen people literally tweet and put out on social media messages like, if you're old enough to be raped, you're old enough to hold a rifle. This is not an either or proposition, not in international law, not in civilized society. You do not put a rifle in the hands of a child. End of story. And yet they're trying to justify this. So we're seeing now what's happened is because the TPLF are in power in certain sections, they're showing their true colors. They have to. So now, uh, as I've said publicly, um, a hungry dog has no loyalty. The media wants the story. So now they're divided. They've hitched their wagon to the idea of the classic underdog, as a certain reporter referred to them, which is just inane. The classic underdog of the TPLF. They only ran the country for like 27 years. Um, and now, it's, now that the TPLF are showing their true colors, they're stuck because it's like, okay, are these guys, we can't portray them as heroes anymore because they're slaughtering people, very obviously slaughtering people. What are we gonna do? Second thing is there are the media that go, well, that's okay, we can go ahead with showing the both side-isms because it's Africa, because of course it's ethnic and oh, the Africans are killing each other. Now, so we are at a very interesting point in the media narrative where these guys have to either step up and be responsible journalists or they are going to try to keep pushing the narrative that they bought into. They bought this, they bought this lie. Are they gonna stick with it or not? Quite frankly, I can't tell you which, but <laughs> it's gonna be Sure is hell interesting because nobody wants to say, I was fooled, I was duped, I made a mistake, uh, these guys lied to me. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to be the chump, but they're going to have to. Uh, Michaela Wrong, who is a fine journalist, I just bought her book recently um, called Do Not Disturb. I haven't gotten deep into it, but very early in the book it says, I made mistakes in terms of how I reported. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. These are not her exact words, but I got misled. To me, that's a courageous stand for a journalist to do.
Um, are we going to see it again? I sure hope so. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the farm on it. I wouldn't bet the farm on these journalists to say, oh, I got misled by a terrorist organization and I made them into heroes. These guys will, as a pack, just go on to the next story and go, well, oh, too bad. You know, they are not accountable to you. That's part of the problem with having these white Europeans and Americans sent over from other news operations. There's no accountability for the very people that they cover. That's one of the biggest problems we have. Okay. As you know, Samantha Power accused the TPLF of some crimes. Um, can we take her comments as its uh, face value? No, <laughs> because nothing Samantha Power says can be taken at face value. This is a person who is weaponizing humanitarian aid, who is using it as a lever of foreign policy. Um, I don't trust a word this woman says. Um, now, she's not alone. I don't trust a word that several of them say in Washington. She's no different. Do you think that the United States of America can afford to lose its uh, uh, partnership with Ethiopia, given Ethiopia's strategic importance? No. Um, I'm a Canadian. Many people online mistake me for an American uh, because we sound the same, <laughs> and we're not. Um, and I grew up in a country which next door to a superpower which constantly thinks that the rest of the world needs it more than the US needs them. And it's wrong. Uh, and it's discovering it's wrong more and more each day. Um, and this country, uh, as I say, people are going to, some people are going to roll their eyes. But the thing is, if we look at history in terms of success stories, uh, Singapore, other certain Botswana, other success stories in history, economic powerhouses. Look at what GERD is going to do for this country. How amazing that's going to be. And of course we have high hopes because you look at the potential that would go, my gosh, what this is going to do in terms of power, water resources, blah, 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 as long as nobody comes along and tries to wreck it and demolish it and sabotage it. Um, so the U.S. should be looking to Ethiopia. I can't speak to Abiy Ahmed's policies because I'm not fluent in the language. I don't know about his agenda, and I am not, as contrary to the criticism online, a shell for the government. I can't even tell you what the government is doing at the time because I can't speak the language. I can only go by what I read in English. And the potential of this country economically um, is immense. Um, and the United States, instead of trying to hammer it and bully it and uh, undermine it by using sanctions and other economic levers to use inflation as a weapon that can destabilize the government, should be saying, okay, what can we do to help keep this country stable? What can we do to lift it up? What can we do to get behind it? Because, wow, how amazing you guys are going to be in the future. I honestly believe that. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has recently visited Turkey and also some other African countries. What kind of message does this convey to the Western world and also to other African nations? Well, the trouble is, is that the Western world is afraid of black people. <laughs> no, but I, I say that facetiously, but it's true. Um, as I said, I've been writing a book, uh, so I've been going over Ali Masri's ideas, I've been going over Stephen, uh, Stephen, Steve Biko's ideas, I've been going over how the Mau Mau rebellion influenced Malcolm X, and within my lifetime in recent history, Europe and North America get really skittish whenever Africa stands up for itself and goes, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. Help or, you know, we'll just do our own thing. So it's, it's really interesting watching the reaction because, of course, what I see is, oh, uh, and the trolls, of course, lead the queue, queue the way that things are going to go by saying, oh, he's cozying up to dictators. He's cozying up to... Where does the United States and Britain get the, have the gall the arrogance to lecture other countries on who they want to seek alliances with 
if you are going to have Donald Trump have his hands on this shiny ball <laughs> with Saudi princes and Biden is going to, you know, um, pull out of Afghanistan and completely betray a people that way. And these previous regimes make deals with the Taliban. Um, no. <laughs> so the message that's sent to the West is, you're not our friend. We see that you're not behaving as our friend. We're going to find other friends, and we're entitled to do that. Talking about uh, Afghanistan, uh, what are some of your observations uh, of the U.S. grand for, if you will, in Afghanistan and its implications on uh, Biden's misguided policy on Ethiopia? Well, of course, people are seizing on that example in relation to TPLF and Ethiopia because Afghanistan was a 20-year debacle in which uh, you went in and what was it all for? Now, there are practical people, I know a couple who say, well, what was the US supposed to do? Stick around for another 20 years? And I can appreciate that. But the thing is, is that you totally betrayed these people. <laughs> you, you just said, okay, we're leaving by X date, off we go. And so you have a reenactment of the fall of Saigon in Kabul where people are pleading and waving their passports around and have their children uh, and going, hey, get us out of here. And we've seen scenes that we haven't seen since, 19, since the 1970s. And it's embarrassing, it's shameful, it's appalling. Um, and of course the United States loses its, has lost a lot of its points in reputation. Now the problem is, is that now they're seeking to bully somebody else for a foreign relations win. Guess who? <laughs> so now they're going to say, well, we're, we got to win somewhere. Who can we pick on? Hi, <laughs> you're over here. This is what they're trying to do. And they've been trying to do it for a while, a while. So they need something. It's the nature of the beast that they go, well, this hurts our pride. This hurts our image. So let's look good somewhere else. Trouble is, they're not educated about Africa. They don't want to be educated about Africa. They don't want to be educated about Ethiopia. They think they are, but they're not. <laughs> and I know they're not because um, I, my sources tell me how some of these high-placed officials speak to African uh, officials and people. Um, I'm going to be writing an article in which there's a wonderful anecdote which reveals the mindset of these people. A highly influential European diplomat basically said to a person, a source, said, um, I'm paraphrasing here, I'll check the actual quote, said, don't you know that the TPLF are the only ones who, are, who should be running this country? And the person who is an African official said, how can you say that? Like the Ethiopians are entitled to decide who should be running their own country. And for this person, it didn't even occur to them. He thought automatically Kingmaker, we should be doing this. That's how they think. It's, it's a colonial mindset. And you, you listen to this and you hear this and go, my God, you haven't changed. You haven't changed in 100, 150 years. You still think that you can decide who's going to run this country, who's going to run that, who we should put in power, blah, blah, blah. So do you think that the United States and its allies are trying to topple the Abe uh, government and uh, bring to power TPLF? Yes. <laughs> yes, I know they are. Uh, I know they are. Um, I have some information that, yes, they... Uh, they want the devil they know. And the thing is, the Biden administration includes several members of its, of its cabinet um, who, look, Susan Rice cannot come back to this country. She just can't. <laughs> She's not welcome here. They're not going to roll out a welcome you know, carpet for her anytime soon. Because why? We know why. Um, several of their administration um, Th either know or are overly chummy with the TPLF and they want the devil they know. Uh, 
for, what's a more interesting question is why they can't get behind the new administration and get behind uh, what they're what is being planned. And again, I'm not endorsing what the Abbey government is doing. What strikes me as bizarre is that they would not try to at least explore the possibility of backing the government and say, okay, this guy's a breath of fresh air or whatever. He's trying to bring in reforms and get behind that. Again, I'm not, I'm not educated enough to make an assessment on the current government. I'm saying any government, why are you not looking to, why are you trying to turn back the clock back to 1990, pick a year? Finally, as you know, um, Ethiopia is uh, gearing up towards its New Year celebration soon. What is your message to Ethiopians and friends of Ethiopia? Oh my, uh, I don't know if I'm entitled to give a message to Ethiopians. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a guest. Um, so anything I have to say is said out of the sincerest humility um, for those who follow me, who are even interested in what I have to say, I would say that there are people of conscience who are with you, who want to see your country succeed, who want to see Ethiopia prevail. Ding! Um, and I think that is going to, the times are tough. I know that people are suffering through inflation. That is not the, that is not anybody's fault here. That is being imposed on you from outside. I really believe that. Um, it is tough to endure that. And the thing is, of course, I get on a plane and I get to go home. So who am I to say that to anybody? But I hope that the resolve that is always natural with the Ethiopian character wills out and that just know that there are people who actually support you, who um, believe in this country, believe in its potential. You have friends abroad. We are trying our best to help um, and we are with you. And maybe that's the best message I can convey. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for your uh, wonderful perspectives. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of this program. Many thanks for your company so far. Until I see you next time with another program, it's goodbye from me, Shifar Alaka. <laughs>